class is in session. These women want to sit on company boards. They've come to the Gordon Institute of Business Science, a top business school in Africa, to learn how. The odds are against them. Very few women in the world know what it's like to sit at a table like this one. Patriarchy has ensured that. But many women, like Gugule Tutaba, a human resources officer at Rosebank College, are fighting the status quo. They are willing to do whatever it takes to pull up a chair at the Oval Desk. Leadership courses like this one are a step in the right direction. For Gugu, it's a reminder of how far she's come. I started off as a receptionist uh, within the company and at the time there was no um, HR department within uh, Rosebank College. Okay, all that was centralised at our main head office which is Avitech. However, my manager as well as our MD was very um, keen on ensuring that we grow as a business, um, grow as a, as a department as well. So they then took um, me in, in terms of my key deliverables to say, I want to be in that department and I myself made it happen and with the support of my manager and line manager as well. Her climb up the ladder didn't happen overnight. I've been working for 10 years now for the same company. Um, what I like and what I've been privileged to have within this company is that they are key drivers of um, transformation of growing key individuals, especially those who are in leadership position or those who aspire to be leaders. They also have a, 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 a neck for recognizing true leadership and also um, invest in their leaders. So that's why I'm here. And what has being on a leadership course like this one taught her? That I've got so much to offer, you know, both um, within my organization as well as um, in the world out there. Um, there's a lot of barriers that we as women um, instill in ourselves to say we're not good enough or uh, this is a man's world, this is a man's job, I cannot do it better than uh, a man can. However, from this experience, I know for sure that I'm more than capable of taking on the world. Do you have aspirations to one day occupy a seat at that board? Of course. And it's never too early to start. Take Tehofata Sekhwele, who works for Johannesburg-based Liberty Financial Solutions. In the past three years I've been there, I've seen like women getting promoted and also the intent to get women to be promoted and the intent to get women in leadership. Uh, though obviously I, I think the numbers and the actual work has not yet been done in terms of like I'm seeing that person in Exco, but I can sense the intent is there. I'm a young black woman and I'm in the corporate space and I definitely would still want to remain and I want to be like a leader. So for me, I wanted to learn what other women who are before me, what they're doing and what I could learn from them. And also just to kind of get an environment where I as a woman will be relevant to the leadership like moving forward. How do I work and integrate with men? And yeah, I think the course is getting me to that sweet spot of saying, you know, this is where you are, this is what you bring, what can other people bring and what can you learn from them? So I am in corporate even if I'm wearing a sweater. It's also never too late for women like Kantha Pele, who has been working for about 28 years. I'm Kantha Pele. I work for Tour Vest Holdings. Uh, I head up the regional office in KZN on the hospitality side. I haven't sat on boards, but I've been like observing a board meeting where I was taken in as an observer because I've insisted to sit on one because I was chosen from Tour Vest to attend this Gibbs course and one of the programs that I've chosen on and my inspiration is to, is to sit on a board meeting. Their lecturer Shireen Chengadu has been teaching women about the skills required in the boardroom for years. Initially, we saw that it was usually in March, which is International Women's Month, or in August, when it was Women's Day and Women's Month in South Africa. So people would, corporates or individuals would sign up to, to send people on uh, or women on women leadership courses. But interestingly, over the last three to four years, there's been a shift. Leadership has now cottoned on to, to the fact that it's smart to have diversity, diversity of women leaders, um, race, gender, class, and 
the, the shift has happened so that we run these courses all through the year. Shireen is no stranger to the boardroom herself. She has sat on three company boards. What does she think women need to cut it at boardroom level? One is to look at things more critically and test assumptions. Because we assume men don't like us, or we assume that it's, it's a race issue or a gender issue, or it's a bit of both. The other thing is belief in yourself. Because very often we, we point the finger at someone else and say, the system is broken, or the policies and practices do not allow me to reach my full potential. And then I say, hold the mirror up to yourself. Maybe that person looking back at you is partly to blame for not, you know, uh, you not reaching your full potential. But ultimately what they walk away with is, I create in them through these programs an, a sense of agency. You are the agent of change. Whether it's for yourself, for your society, or for the country, or for the institution you come from. But the urgency to do it, because the time is now. Time's up, as Oprah said, time's up. And you can't let those opportunities ride, because ultimately it'll be someone else's time in a short while, and you would have missed the opportunity. So the agency and urgency to, to act now. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men. But their time is up. This was Oprah's speech at Hollywood's prime event, the Golden Globe Awards in January this year. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. And when that new day finally dawns, it will be because of a lot of magnificent women, many of whom are right here in this room tonight, and some pretty phenomenal men. But as these statistics show, that day has yet to dawn. Last year, the world regressed in closing the gender gap in the economy, according to the World Economic Forum's 27 Global Gender Gap Report. The report also revealed that it will take over 200 years for men and women to earn the same salary for doing the same job. For South Africa, the picture is also bleak, especially at boardroom level. Among the biggest 104 companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, only 29 companies have 30% or more women on their boards. The number gets smaller when it comes to top executive positions. Only three companies listed on the JSC have women chief executive officers. And only 10 listed companies have women as chief financial officers. Moreover, 56% of all work women do in South Africa is unpaid, compared with just 25% for men. Polish-born Magda Wierzewska is one of the very few female CEOs amongst the companies listed on the JSC. She is founder of Signia, a successful asset management firm that manages about 184 billion rand worth of assets. Magda is well known for speaking out against corporate and government corruption on Twitter. What's less known is how humble her beginnings were. Well, I came to South Africa, you know, as I was 13 years old when we arrived here, but, you know, I was born in Poland, you know, kind of communist system. And um, early 1980s, you know, all these satellites of USSR started running out of money, literally this communist system of free health care, full employment, uh, you know, free education, went bankrupt overnight. And there were massive food shortages, you know, people were issued food, with food stamps, but there was no food. And in that very short window of time, about three million people left Eastern Europe as refugees, illegally, and landed up in these refugee camps in Austria and Germany. 
and then from there you could apply for immigration to countries that would accept immigrants. So that's kind of United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. And during that period, the National Party here in South Africa realized that in those camps, they had doctors, they had engineers, electricians. And so they opened up the embassy in Vienna, put up posters and said, we're hiring, we're hiring medical doctors for the army. And that's how we landed up in South Africa. My parents are medical doctors. So we landed up in Pretoria. And then, you know, we didn't speak any English. We certainly didn't speak any Afrikaans. And we didn't know a single thing about South Africa. So those were kind of quite tough years. But, you know, the thing about those years is that, you know, I became very self-sufficient because we kind of had to, you know, my parents had to rebuild their lives. We came here with nothing. I mean, literally my father had $500 in the bank account. So, um, you know, they had to concentrate on trying to make a living, on learning the language, on working, on buying every cup, every saucer, every spoon. Um, so that kind of left myself, and I've got a younger sister and brother, uh, very much to our own devices in terms of, you know, we kind of had to sort out our own schooling. Um, you know, we had to make our own decisions very early on in life. Life became a little easier as she climbed the corporate ladder. But challenges remained, especially in the male-dominated industry of finance. So being and wanting to work in a men's world means that you need to de uh, develop Teflon skin. I always talk about it as living in a perspex box. So when I walk into a boardroom full of men, I literally picture myself, I don't picture people naked, I picture myself in a perspex box. So nothing can hurt me. You know, they can say whatever they say. Um, I've, over the years, learned not to take things personally at all. And you kind of train yourself to react like a man would. Like most women in the corporate world, Magda had to learn the hard way. It took me a number of years to figure out um, what the bonus negotiations were all about. You know, so, so a man walks into a bonus negotiation discussion and they immediately talk about their achievements and how much they want to be paid. You know, a woman walks into the same bonus discussion and the easiest way of unhinging a woman is for, you know, the, the person in charge to then say to her, your work is excellent, uh, you've brought in a lot of business and, and literally this has happened to me numerous times. Uh, so we're not going to discuss your work. Let's focus on the fact that everyone hates you. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying, but let's focus on how many people you've upset or how people dislike you or they dislike your style. And you know what, with an average woman, and you immediately switch your attention from trying to focus on your work to being upset over the fact that people don't like you. And you know what, after that you'll accept any bonus that's on the table. If you thought being a woman in the corporate world is tough, being a black woman could be even tougher. Today, Nguli Bohope is respected in South Africa's property sector. She is the president of the South African Institute of Property Practitioners. But this wasn't always the case. I, I ran a project for Rio Tinto when I was putting together their head office for Africa. And I was the client, and I was the female, and I was the young one in the room. I must say, though, that uh, many a times, I mean, I remember when I started at Rio and I tried setting up the first site visit, at least three people asked, and all of them, of course, white and male, asked, when is your manager coming through from London? I said, but he's not. I'm here. You know, and it didn't stop there. They proceeded to send him emails and say, when are you coming? Because we are doing these side visits and you're not here. And it had to take another male being your sponsor. You know, so essentially he, he became my sponsor by way of saying, you have that person there, I have appointed her, she's good and capable, and therefore that is your point of contact. I will only pitch in if she requires me to or if she needs my support, but in the meantime, that is who the client is, you know. 2017 also saw three black women make history. Heather Sun became the first black female chairman of furniture retailer Steinhoff. 
Nongkululeko Nyembezi also became the first black female to chair the board of finance firm Alexander Forbes. Then there was Ndlamulo Ndlomu, who was also appointed as the first black female CEO of audit firm KPMG. Historic as these appointments were, they also clashed with rough times related to these companies. We all know the story behind Steinhoff International, which is at the center of investigations over accounting fraud. Heather Sun replaced billionaire Christo Visa, who resigned to avoid a conflict of interest while investigations at Steinhoff continue. Nongkululeko Nyembezi was called to step in at Alexander Forbes after their first appointment, Moses Hosanna, could no longer take the job. He was the ex-KPMG boss accused of turning a blind eye when auditing the books of the controversial Gupta family. This facilitated 30 million rands of taxpayers' money paying for the lavish Gupta Sun City wedding in 2014 that Mr. Hosanna attended. Ndlamulo Lomu's appointment also came as a result of the scandal that hit KPMG. Make no mistake, the qualifications and experience of these women to do these jobs were not in question, as their CV show. What was the question is why they were not appointed by these companies sooner. Was it all about the crisis? Shonda Rhimes has this beautiful video called My Year, My Year of Saying Yes. And so when there's an opportunity, take it. But also learn when to say no. Because you can't be all things to all people. For India Martin, former top executive at US Bank JP Morgan and award-winning leadership expert and coach, the answer is simple. People see women as, they see us as safe in a lot of ways, but we also can handle a crisis. Um, you don't see, I mean, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because when, you, when I think about the political battles that I ever had at work, they didn't involve the women. You know, or when I watched political battles, per se, and it might not have included me. Um, it didn't, it, it wasn't about women. But I will say that, um, that if a company is to fail, it would fall on that woman's shoulders afterwards, right? Um, and that's happened in a number of places around the world. However, um, what I will say is that for me, being seeing black women run these because I don't because we don't have that right you know the the wonderful thing about South Africa and about the continent in general is that there are black people who are doing these things and we have it in in the kind of you know UK US Europe we have some that's for sure um, but not at this scale and it's a huge and tremendous opportunity um, and I do think that actually there will be um, safety because of that I think that that we're capable. India is one of the 50 top businesswomen in Europe and the top 100 black executives in the UK. With a 25-year career in financial services, she says the landscape for gender equality has become better in some parts of the world there's starting to be some action, particularly in Europe. I mean, like, Northern Europe is so far ahead when you think about, like, Finland and Norway and places like that. Um, the UK has gotten a lot better. I mean, in terms of the 30% women on boards, they're just about there. I um, mean, they did that without quotas. Um, the US is behind the curve, far behind the curve, and it's getting worse now with the current administration and some of the behaviors that we're seeing. India also works with forums like the 30% Club, a global network that campaigns for 30% of board members to be women. I was so amazed um, and excited to see that there were like 45 companies that were signed up to the 30% Charter, because that's a big number in, a con in an economy this size. It's huge and it's growing, but when you compare it to places like the UK or the US, it's smaller. So to see that there were 45 companies made me quite heartened, you know, and also to see that the, that we've managed to, through the 30% Club, I was sat in the very first um, founding of the 30% Club in London, um, and I guess it was 2009, 2010, um, and 
Helena Morrissey, who started it, actually chartered the South Africa, the group here in South Africa. Um, and, and I love that we're using the same methodology around the world to get this done, um, recognizing that there are some things that are different in different economies that work or may not work. So for example, in Northern Europe, again, they did quotas and they were like, you're going to do this and do it quickly. So they put quotas in place and they were like, you know, 40% women on boards, you know, literally overnight almost, um, which demonstrates that it's not about talent. Right, and that's that's what their that's what their view was. This is not about talent. We have the talent. Um, in other industries, you'll say people will say, "Well, we have. We don't know about this pipeline. We don't know where these women are going to come from." Um, but we're not looking for them. And one of the challenges that we see, and I think this is global, and I'm bringing this back to South Africa, um, is that for women, we keep our heads down and get our jobs done. And there, it, it requires more than that in, when you're moving on into the kind of board space. Um, their, their behaviors, even through the leadership pipeline and up, you know, kind of up into the CEO kind of space or C-suite space at all, um, it requires more than that. And there are behaviors that are not natural to us. And it's kind of this corporate competency, I call it, kind of bicultural competency around being female and the corporate expectation around how we'll behave. But are women also to blame for not securing more seats at the table? To a large extent. I would agree with that statement. So having said we are in a patriarchal society, it means, you know, that our landscape defaults to men in leadership, you know, generally. However, um, I've also seen um, that, you know, as, as we grow into our careers, so do we grow within our family lives. So uh, we've got all these different areas of our lives, right? So now I've got children. I know many women who consciously, and this is the strangest thing, you know, we all grow up and we have these aspirations of being something big in the corporate world, blah, blah, blah. But as we now are at that age where we are mothers and our children are at school and there's all kinds of activities that happen and we can't be there for them as much as we would like to. And in addition to this patriarchal society where the workplace doesn't really allow as much flexibility for one to, to, to have a work-life balance, you know. Therefore, it, it forces the women to make a different conscious decision that says, you know what, the higher I go in this corporate ladder, the less I can give of myself to my children and my family. If you look at asset management, it's very much of an environment driven by money and money motivates two emotions greed and fear and greed and fear usually result in extra levels of testosterone and aggression that's how they manifest themselves so in a typical asset management company there is huge amount of aggression huge amount of shouting screaming um, arguing aggressively um, because everyone is fighting for a limited pool of money and trying to convince everyone else that they're better than they are. And so, you know, when I've run investment teams, I've employed numerous women, I've tried to introduce numerous women into the system, and invariably they would resign after a while. And the comment was always the same. And that was, Magda, who needs this? Why do I have to sit in this non-collaborative environment where I have to fight? I don't want that. I want, you know, as a woman, I want to work in a team. I want to be part of a team, I want to be recognized for what I do, I don't want to have to fight to be recognized for what I do. So, you know, the blame lies on both sides. There's also the notion that women don't support each other. Some believe women that get to the top don't help those still trying to climb the corporate ladder. You know, I think that's a really personal question, actually. And when I say that, I mean, I think it depends on the person, but increasingly I'm not seeing that be the case. I don't want to take one bad experience and make it into a blanket experience, you know, but I've, I've certainly been on the receiving end of a woman who's just vicious and out there to make sure that they like drop that ladder and I must just fall over, you know. Um, but I, I always choose to, to, to rather focus on the positive um, and I've found that it's not in my entire career that I have experienced women in that fashion. It was just that one incident and therefore I don't want to paint a blanket uh, picture. But having said that, in my entire career, I've probably only had a, a woman line manager once or twice. Back at the classroom, a few words of sage advice are always welcome. 
I always say to young women, um, you know, this world is yours. You know, there are folks who had to go through a lot um, to be able to open the doors for you to be able to do any of the things that you can do. Um, and those of us who've been in this for a long time are moving in towards the kind of eldership of this. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the actual, actual fact, but you have the support and the world is yours and you just have to make a decision that's what you're gonna do. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't um, because now you have examples of women who have, who look like you, um, who think like you, who've come from varied backgrounds. So, there, so, the, so whereas there once weren't the role models, you have them now. So use them, leverage them, look at them, study them um, and go and take over the world because it's yours to do. It doesn't matter how bright you are. It really doesn't. It doesn't even matter how many talents you are you have. It's much more important how hard you are prepared to work. That is actually, apart from a dose of good luck, that is, the, in my view, the main determinant of success. Go for it. Go all the way for it, you know. Um, like I said, we can't change a system that we are not in. So you have to be in it to win it. You have to be in it to win it, you know. And if we plan to change the way the workplace accepts women and their growth and all the areas of their lives, then we have to be there to make those adjustments. You know, we have to be there to bring those views into the boardroom that say, um, how, how are we accommodating for mothers? How are we accommodating in this office for females to be equally comfortable as the men are? But if you're not even at the table, you can't, you can't bring those changes on. The biggest lesson to be learned for the granddaughters of these women is that it's still going to be tough, but certainly not impossible to sit at the boardroom table. <music>